Okay. Uh, oh, you. Uh, yeah. Thanks for remembering that. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Um, yeah, we'll start now. Um, so I'm Steve Cross. I'm a member of Go Green Whitcomb. And uh, thanks to everyone for coming. And we'll crack on. And maybe a few people will join later on, but it's going to be recorded anyway. So if, Ian, if you want to put up the slides, and I'll start chatting. So that's just an introductory slide showing that it's idea uh, who will be doing the main part of the presentation and Go Green Wickham who helps sort of coordinate all this. So if you go on to the next slide, it's a, uh, the next slide will show you a brief uh, summary of the presentation. So it starts with me talking a bit about Go Green Wickham, who we are and what we've been looking at. And then most of it, will, then there will be a section that Ian will take over, Ian Dunstan, from idea uh we'll talk through what what they do who they are and what they do what the offer is and then it'll be the q a at the end so if you go on to that and this is it so go green Whitcomb was originally it was started by uh, tim williamson who's here about 10 years ago or so uh originally was focused on thermal insulation but, uh, at the end of last year towards the end of last year they expanded the vision uh, in 2020 and although they still they still offer the thermal imaging camera for checking things like insulation um, we've also set out to try and inform local residents about other green options, um, and these include, or they include the Green Homes Grants, which originally seemed to be a broader, a, a broader uh, approach to things, but now it's more it seems to be taken over by local authorities rather than central government, and it's focusing on affordable warmth. Um, we also uh, try we try to help uh, local people understand how they could switch uh, to green energy suppliers. By we researched. Uh, different options of doing that. And we put website uh, links to websites on the Go Green Whitcomb um, website ourselves. So people could, could look at that as an option. Uh, and the third thing we started looking at was what could we do to maybe get people more interested in installing solar panels, uh, which is the focus of this presentation. And the PV part of solar panels is the voltaic, photovoltaic, is the ones that turn light into electricity. So uh, this is, uh, the three ways we considered how we get people interested and in, involved in uses of, of uh, voltaic, solar voltaic, uh, photovoltaic panel technology. Uh, one was self-install, which originally included the Green Homes Grant, but as I said, that's changed. But it's also, as we're talking about today, helping people look at arranging their own solar PV installation by getting involved in something like a bulk purchase scheme, which is what Ian will talk about, what IDEA do. Um, another thing we could do, we, people could do locally, which I've done and, and I know other people in the area have done, is invest in a local uh, green uh, energy community benefit society, such as Bath and West Community Energy, who do very large installations in fields and on large buildings. And in relation to that, also we've said to people, you can nominate buildings in your area, that be schools, churches, offices, that somebody like BWCE might be able to put a, a panels on uh, for that property. So those are the sort of things that we were doing, but the focus today, as I said, is bulk purchase scheme. So, we're, but uh, we've gone to the next slide because we also, before we sort of started putting together the bulk purchase scheme, we, we or talking about it and understanding it more, we thought, well, how many solar panels are installed in our area anyway? And you can see on this map, there's a red dotted line uh, all the way around the area that we uh, surveyed, and we surveyed in two ways: one using Google Maps. And those are uh, the bulk of the data was was from Google Maps originally. But then, uh, then we thought, well, we better actually walk around the area as well, because, uh, you know, there may be things on the Google Maps is like two years old and, and there may be more recent installations. And there were uh, if you see the ones in squares uh, uh, that have blue numbers and um, those are all ones that were not on google maps but they've been installed in the last year or so including top left one that's outside the area but visible from uh, the area is on the new student building on lower bristol road um so this there's anything that's in square or oblongs are, are solar panels pv photovoltaic and anyone in circles are water heaters and then the ones that have dark green in the middle are listed buildings so we've got in our, specifically in our area, there are three listed buildings, one sort of top middle, slightly left with number five, and that's just water uh, panels, but it's still similar size. And there, one on the sort of center right and down a bit is a farm on um, Private Hill, which, uh, uh, which is um, uh, uh, got panels, both types of panels. 
And then there's one on the center left with 10 panels, which is a listed building. There's one on the far left, which is just outside the area. I haven't been able to 100% prove it's a, it is a listed building, but, but uh, ex exactly if it's panels, it's one I've seen from the sky and, and I can't get around to see it. I'll probably have to get a drone if I want to see it. Anyway, that's, that's the, the, the map. And then the summary of the data is on the next slide. And it basically says, uh, you know, there's 42 houses in the area that are surveyed. It, on average, they've got uh, about 11 uh, panels per house, um, which is a reasonable number. And then there's, uh, it also shows that there's 13 houses that have the uh, water panels for heating water. There's also two properties, which are large properties, but one's a church in Bear Flat, which is centre left again, got 24 panels, 12 on the east, 12 on the west uh, roof. And then in the bottom, uh, just off to the left, centre bottom, there's in a field, uh, um, uh, horse, honeysuckle farm, is, uh, there are 48 solar panels. So 42 houses make up 1.3% of, of, of the household, according to the 2011 uh, census. And Baines recently in their targets of 2030, trying to get zero carbon, they've said 50% of houses in the area should have, or ideally should have solar panels on. So that's a big jump to make. And that's another reason why we're meeting here today to have this discussion. The council have also set, talked about large solar arrays, ground mounted or on buildings, 116 of a huge size, equivalent to the football pitch size. Plus they're talking about 28 wind turbines. Um, but as I say, there are uh, uh, three properties that are listed buildings. So now we're going to go on to talk a little bit about listed buildings, because in Bath, being a UNESCO, UNESCO World Heritage City, it's no surprise there's lots of listed buildings. Um, and it's not straightforward to get solar panels installed, but it's not impossible, as researchers show. The map I'm showing you now is a map from Baines Council, which shows all the green uh, outlines of listed buildings. You can see at the top in the centre there, the top centre, that's obviously the centre of Bath, lots of listed buildings. But in the Whitcomb area, the centre of Whitcomb, there's some down by the river and the canal, and then dotted out, there are others. And, 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 and now the next slide will show you where those three are again that I told you about. Um, those are three listed buildings and all the information about how they got their planning, et cetera, et cetera, is, is in the uh, Baines planning department. You can easily find them. Excuse me. If we go on to the next slide, this is actually one of those three uh, listed buildings in the area that we survey. And the classic thing that it has that's important, that's, that's helped it to get approved, is a, what they call a double pitched roof. Some people call it a butterfly roof or a, something like that. But if you, the photo on the left, um, you're actually looking uh, from the east to west. So if you then go over to the roof plan on the right, uh, you can see that, that it's just not quite north and um, you, you would be on the right side of that looking down the central gully and you can see where they're planning to put the solar panels on this inside roof, which is facing more or less south. Um, so this, that, was, that was basically what they proposed. Um, they put 10 panels on and it's the key thing about that then is because they're in that inner pitch, you can't see them from, from the ground. That's the key thing because it doesn't disturb with it being a listed building. If you go on to the next slide, you can see uh, these are observations that, that were, were in the Baines Planning Department's delegate report. The to I'm not a planning expert, but this is just pure quotes from, from the report. So the historic environment team said that 10 solar panels considered to be acceptable in this instance because they're mounted on a roof, there's no long-term damage, they're positioned in a discrete location, and the applicant has demonstrated the PV panels are for part of a wider energy strategy. So it's part of getting greener. Building control, that's standard. You, you would probably need building regs application. It means it's been built properly. That, that shouldn't be a problem. And that very interesting, the Bath Preservation Trust, no objection. Then uh, the, at the end, the officer who assessed it, he basically said it was acceptable. And the key, key statement, microgeneration technology is important to reach the local uh, targets for sustainability. Um, again, the panels were in a discrete location and they were part of a wider, you know, uh, uh, go, getting greener sort of um, approach. Ticks all the boxes. And then basically this was approved just over 10 years ago. The next slide, uh, next um, January, 2010. So those have been installed. And you can see on the next slide, a photograph of them. Uh, on the photograph on the left, that's basically the Google map photograph. So you can see they're more or less facing south, slightly southeast. 
Um, and there's 10 of them hidden away in, in that. And I never knew, I've lived here over 20 years. I never knew they were there. You can't see them. Um, the rest of this slide tells you about how Baines have set up a website there, Energy at Home, where it helps give you about planning, planning advice for listed buildings. So that was basically what we did. And then we thought, well, we need to go out and talk, you know, find out about who could be installers. And um, we did some quick research amongst ourselves. And we found that in places like in Froome and Marshfield and, and um, uh, Chippenham, three you know, towns, reasonable sized towns with good community action groups, they had uh, uh, gone for bulk purchase already. And, and uh, so we interviewed the suppliers for those. And in fact, IDEA did two of those. They did Marshfield and Froome and another supplier uh, did Chippenham. So we interviewed them, we asked them all the same sorts of questions. And then these are sort of, uh, if you like, our decision parameters on why we went for, uh, I, we thought IDEA would be a good one to work with because IDEA actually can offer smaller sizes, which may suit some people. Um, you may not have a big enough roof space. So 1.44 kilowatts versus the other supplier's minimum is three. Uh, IDEA would, would go, if we get six households to go for this, they will offer the discount. The other supplier was 10. IDEA was a mono uh, uh, crystalline panels, um, which are basically the most modern ones, and they're black. So they actually, are, as I understand it, they're more likely to be acceptable to planning. Um, the other supplier had very good panels, but polycrystalline slightly, uh, slightly more shiny, more obvious. Both can do uh, scaffolding and, and install meters as required. Both had all the necessary insurance and accreditation. The bulk discount seemed to be slightly greater with idea, possibly more so with the lower ones, but Ian will go on to that with, with the smaller um, uh, installation volumes. But Ian will talk you through all that. Um, and again, the sort of pre-installation informa uh, pre information, similar for both suppliers. You know, what's the roof size, the angle of the roof, uh, the direction, et cetera. Uh, and that, if you sign up to go for one, uh, to, to work with Ian with IDEA, you'll get all that information. So now I hand over to, to Ian. Thank you very much for that um, intro. Um, I'm gonna, uh, I will ask that, I, I have put everyone on mute. You can unmute yourself, but just ask that um, if you have questions, either use the chat box, which I can't see right now, or, um, or or just wait until the end. If, if we can wait until the end, uh, I'm gonna, we'll try to answer all the questions at the same time. Um, Steve, can you confirm that you can hear me okay before I start rambling? Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Excellent, okay, thank you. Um, so I, I started IDEA back in 2007. Um, I left the army in 2007 um, after 15 years. I trained to be an electrician. Uh, and then just at about the same time, the feed-in tariffs, uh, et cetera, came in for solar panels. It looked really interesting. Uh, it looked like an opportunity for the future, so we started installing. Um, since then, I've installed over well over a 1,000 domestic systems, uh, commercial installations, including schools, other, other businesses, regular commercial properties. Uh, I've, even built a solar, I've even built a solar farm uh, in Caution, the Waterbit Country Store. Just behind there, we've, we've put a 5 megawatt 30 acre uh, solar panel system there about six years ago, still very strong. Um, so all that time we've, 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 we've helped um, customers to change their energy usage patterns and, and have intelligent management, uh, energy management systems. Um, these are accreditations which all installers should have. I'll just briefly, briefly go into them. HICE is the consumer um, code that we have to adhere to. This covers thing. This, this ensures things like we um, only charge the correct amount for a deposit, which is twenty five percent. It ensures that we have um, protection for people's uh, deposit payments. So when they make their deposit payment, if they were if we were to be out of business before the installation were to take place, then these guys ensure that that work is carried out by another installer for the same price and the same quality. And Heist also cover our installation warranty. So if in the unlikely event that we are out of business before the end of our five-year warranty period, then they would send engineers out to look after that installation for you. MCS, every installer has to be MCS accredited. Uh, in order to get your SEG payments, which I'll come on to shortly, uh, you need an MCS certificate to say that it was just installed by an approved installer using approved products. 
Uh, the NAPITS part of it is just part of building regulations, which Steve mentioned. Um, we we self-accredit our work, we carry out the work, and then we notify building regulations through NAPIT. Um, this, this, was a, this was a call to action, really, about the climate emergency. I, I think I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, I think we all understand what situation we're in. This, this actually slides maybe 18 months old. Uh, I, think, I don't think I need to talk about um, the situation we're in too much. But I will talk about briefly how um, the solar panels actually work, just to clear up a few myths here. What this, what this um, picture represents is energy sunlight hitting these solar panels it doesn't have to be a purely south facing roof anywhere from east through south to west works well um, east and west together actually actually is, it works really well um, the electricity that comes out of the panels here is dc electricity not usable by the property so it needs to go through an inverter this inverter is often located in the loft it could equally be located outside or even in a garage. That inverter converts the DC electricity from the roof into usable AC electricity to be used in the property. That inverter requires a connection to the national grid for it to work. It needs to monitor the incoming grid voltage. It then matches that grid voltage, exceeds the voltage slightly, so that the property uses the electricity from the solar panels before it uses energy from the grid. Anything that isn't used within the property at the time of generation is exported out to the grid. That exported electricity can be used to heat hot water, to charge a battery, or indeed actually be exported and you can make a small income through the smart export guarantee, which I'll come on to in a second. Why install solar? Uh, well, quite simply, take control of energy costs. Big in the news this week. Um, you actually take control of, of an element of your future costs. The climate change argument is a good one. Reduce your reliance on the grid. Protect yourself from the inevitable electricity prices all wrapped up in the same premise. You can make a small income from getting paid for your excess electricity. And actually, any landlords, you, you actually improve your home's energy rating. Improve, improving your energy rating, if you rent a property, it helps you. Uh, you're obligated, actually, now to have a, an energy rating of a certain level. Um, and actually having a good energy rating, if you were to come to sell your house, may well in, improve your chances of selling that property. So when you've got your um, solar panels installed and you're not using a battery, the idea is to use electricity from your panels as it's being generated. So ways we can do that, so quite simple ways we can do that, is to use our energy intensive products and appliances during the daytime. We, before we leave in the morning, we always press a three hour delay on the dishwasher. Half past 10, 11 o'clock on most days, the solar panels are largely contributing to that appliance. That's just one of the small things we do at home. We also have, uh, you can also install what's called an iBoost. This is a bit of kit that senses excess electricity being exported to the grid and then feeds that into your hot water tank, if you have a hot water tank. It's just a, a, a nice, easy, relatively cheap way to use excess electricity to save yourself what probably gas in your area. So you, you would save yourself gas heating the hot water. Again, the price of gas has gone up, as we know about this week. Battery operated devices, if you've got stuff in the garage, if you've got, if you've got hand tools, garden tools, mobile phones, laptops, charge them in the day. You can put them on a plug. You can set a time on a plug to, to come on at certain hours in the middle of the day. And you could almost, and, and you can bank on those then being um, charged from the solar panels. Or indeed, the more expensive and, and the most uh, effective way to, to utilize your solar energy is a smart battery. The smart export guarantee, this, is, um, this came into play a couple of years ago, and any, um, any utility company with more than 150,000 customers are obligated to offer a smart export guarantee. Unfortunately, they were not told that it had to be a certain amount. All, all, all they were told to do was offer a smart export guarantee of above zero. 
Um, it is a competitive market. The best, the, the best smart export guarantee at the moment is about five and a half P and that's from Bold Energy. Octopus also have a very good smart export guarantee, but all of the major suppliers will have one. Usually you have to have your smart export guarantee paid to you by your energy provider. And, and the other thing, the, um, in order to get the smart export guarantee, you will have to have a, uh, a second generation smart meter. It's called a SMETS 2 on the slide. Um, that would need to be organized by your electricity provider. Um, there was just a, one small uh, thing on, on, on Steve's presentation that we can install metering. Uh, it said smart metering, we can't install smart meters. We install meters that measure everything to do with your solar array, but we, we, we can't install smart meters. Now the battery system, these are really interesting, uh, really exciting bit of technology. Over the last two or three years, these, these have come on leaps and bounds. Um, but the, the basic idea of the battery is, is to capture excess generation during the day for usage in the evening. Um, it's always been a problem with, with solar in that you, you get a nice big spike of, of generation in the middle of the day when people aren't necessarily around to use that electricity. So a battery there, this basic function could, could level out the, the usage of electricity generated by the solar panels. The most exciting thing about the batteries for me is now, is, is now the batteries are able not only to charge from your solar panels, but to charge from the grid. So we can actually accept a, a, a kind of tariff from your electricity supplier that is higher, at a higher rate in the day, which we don't mind when we have solar panels because we know our solar panels contribute largely to our running costs in the day. But with that tariff comes a cheap overnight tariff. There are a handful out there. Um, Octopus Energy have a really good tariff. Um, it's called Octopus Go, and that's five pence per unit for four hours every night. But in, so in the winter, when your solar panels cannot generate enough electricity to satisfy your demand in the house and charge your battery, you can actually set your battery to winter mode and the battery will charge from the grid overnight at a cheap rate and then discharge during the day, saving you electricity every day of the year. So the battery becomes uh, a 365 day useful appliance uh, as opposed to the basic function of the battery, which just works in that kind of five, six months of the year where the weather's good. And there will be a time uh, soon when you, you actually uh, start engaging with a wholesale energy market for your battery. Your battery can, can then be used to charge during the day and it can be trolled by somebody else. This isn't happening yet, but it will come soon where your battery can, can be uh, charged from the grid during the day in order to discharge at peak times in the evening, between 4 and 7 p.m. typically during the winter months. And your battery can actually start to make you a proper income uh, by, by, by acting on the wholesale energy market. But it's not there yet. Uh, another part of that, by the way, is electric cars. The, the same principle with electric cars. Your, your, your car can become uh, uh, an instrument by which you can trade on the energy uh, market. Watch this space in the next couple of years. Uh, the Solar Streets offer, um, we, we came up with this idea a couple of years ago. The idea was to offer a reduced rate for a bulk purchase. That's it. If we have a set price, my prices are here. We have a set price for anything from four to 14 solar panels. Um, that price is the same for everybody who takes part in the scheme. There are slight variations in those prices, and those variations come when there's extra scaffolding needed. Uh, if people want panels integrated into the roof, we can do that, but it comes at an extra cost. All those costs are pre-published, so everyone can see that. Um, during the site surveys, we give energy efficiency advice, and we also put £50 towards a community energy fund for every installation we carry out. The process by which we carry this out, someone emails us, phones us, they go into our database. We then contact that customer directly and we carry out a desktop survey. On that desktop server, we may ask people to send photos if that's practical for them to do so. We can then, if, if the system is, it just cannot be done because it's too small a roof or it's too much shading, 
uh, we, we can rule that out at that stage. But nine times out of 10, we can do the quote based on the desktop survey. If that, so if that quote looks good in principle, then we won't take any money off anybody until someone has been to site. We will then come to site, hopefully do three or four visits in a day. We'll then look at the inside of the roof, the outside of the roof, we'll assess practicalities of getting scaffold into that, that site. And then if it all looks good, then the customer can, can go on and book the installation. We will ask for a 25% deposit to secure the equipment. And then when we've got the six, minimum six uh, properties to install, we'll arrange uh, an installation process over a couple of days, two or three days, to come and install those in, in, in one go. Uh, this has changed in the last 24 hours. Really, we've had over 800 inquiries. We've completed over 620 site surveys and completed over 200 installations under the Solar Street Scheme. I've already mentioned, um, I'm coming to the end now, I've already mentioned um, independence from the grid. It's become apparent in the last couple of days from, from the calls we're getting here, that people just want to have uh, a bit of independence. Um, the, the grid is clearly more volatile than we thought and the costs from the grid can vary now. With average at the moment, it's about 17p. Um, it is estimated to be closer to 25, even 30p before too long per unit. Um, and having a solar panel system alone could could your solar panels could contribute one third of your usage. So you're securing, you're paying up front a lower rate, a third of your electricity bill. With a battery, you, you could be securing two thirds of your requirement of electricity from your own generation on your roof. It just reduces um, the risk of, of being subject to uh, much higher energy costs. And this is us in Froome where, where it started. Um, we'd actually completed a number of quite a number of installations at this point. In the background there, you can see um, some solar panels. That's on the YMCA building. Uh, Froome Council decided they would put um, a system on that building with the community fund that we that, that we helped put money into. It's actually quite a big installation. So so um, Freeco Froome Renewable Energy also contributed some money. Um, so that's just one of the community projects that, that, that have come out the back end of the solar street. I really feel like I've been talking to myself <laughs> for the last 15 minutes. Um, now, I'm going to invite everyone, anyone to ask questions if they have, if they have any. I'm going to stop sharing this. Um, um, can I unmute everybody? If anybody has questions, they can unmute themselves and and just like kind of put and, and, and just speak up really um, and we'll try to answer as many questions as, as I can. Uh, Hi. I, I, um, thanks thanks for a good presentation. Uh, nice to nice to hear what you're all doing and I appreciate the work you're you're doing to put this together. So um, uh, one question is whether you can put um, solar panels on flat roofs. Uh, short answer is, is yes. Okay. Um, it, it comes with challenges. Yeah. Um, so a flat roof, um, we, we don't need to get planning permission unless it's a listed building. We don't need, no, it's not. We, don't, we don't need planning permission if, okay. if panels don't protrude above the roof more than 200 millimeters. Right. Put panels on a flat roof. You have to you have to elevate the panels to, to, to get the pitch to, to face the sun. So we are, we're automatically going past that two hundred millimeters barrier. So it needs planning permission. Um, the other the, the other issue we have with flat roofs is um, convincing them to stay on the roof. Yeah, we can penetrate the roof and actually screw into the to the to the, to the timber beneath. No one likes that. Um, no, well, it, it's not good because you then damage the membrane, which is what's keep making it waterproof. Exactly. So we've never actually done that. So the other way to do that is to weigh the panels down. Um, so we need some ballast on the mounting system in order to keep the panels from blowing off. Uh, so we need to have that, that roof structure assessed to make sure it can cope with the extra weight. Right. But yes, it, it can. And we, and we do do, we, we probably do one week. 
So, so it's not it's, it's not beyond us to do that. It just comes with a couple of extra challenges. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And, and sorry, one other question while we're at it is uh, how much are the batteries that you're talking about? What sort of price are, are you talking about with those? Yeah, um, my price schedule is right here in front of me. Um, so the batteries are our battery of choice right now is is a Give Energy battery. Uh, it's a UK company. They're not made in the UK. Uh, all the tech support is in the UK. All the software developments and updates are run by the UK. Uh, we are in the, one of we're, we're one of the ten um, uh, distinguished installers in the country for Give Energy, and we're alongside like Eon and EDF. So we're, we're in good company. Uh, okay. But this, they start at two thousand nine hundred pounds for a five kilowatt hour battery. Um, and if we were to go really, really crazy uh, and have 16.4 as the other end of the spectrum, that is £5,700. Um, our, our most common battery that we're selling at the moment is 8 kilowatt hours. And that is 3550 Okay. And what did you say the, the largest one was? How much, What's the kilowatt? 16.4. So there's really two batteries. There's a 5.2 kilowatt hour and there's an 8.2 kilowatt hour, and they okay. can both and they can both be installed as multiples. Okay. You can't right. have you can't have a five and an eight, but you can have two eight, two fives. I see. I see. Yeah. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you. That's that's my questions. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Deborah. I know Rupert's had a question. Um, yeah, on the listed um, building issue. Um, the example provided earlier, well, albeit 10 years ago, obviously made much of the discrete location, which I presume was a code language for being completely invisible within the, the butterfly roof. Um, do we think there's any prospect of a listed building with a flat roof getting permission to put panels on today? Uh, I, I can try to answer that because I did the research, um, Rupert, and um, there's an interesting one. I mentioned that there's a farm on um, on the hill up by Prior Park. It's got solar panels and it's got a couple of water solar water panels. The solar panels that are, are on a flat roof, but the flat roof is between two, I think, it's a very, and it's a very complicated one, I think, because I think it's, it's called, it's within the... Uh, curtilage of the listed buildings sometimes that's allowed sometimes not but that one is allowed but it's not actually on the listed building so I'm, to have it on the listed building might be complicated i don't know i mean I, i'm very uh, happy to try in the basis that we all have to make an effort but i think realistically if we assume that my roof or at least the panels on top would be visible to about half half of the city uh, <laughs> i'm assuming going into this the answer is no but that doesn't stop me from um uh, having it being tempted to have a crack at it good to set a precedence for it yeah exactly and then related question uh on a frames required etc would it be an absolute waste of time on a flat roof to forget about the a frames and actually lay them flat mindful that that's far from ideal but at least you wouldn't have the shadowing effect so you could cram more panels in even though they're not operating as efficiently um and, and we can we can certainly model when we when we do the design we, we put the um, the orientation the pitch of the panels into the design and we and we can and we can model it at zero degree pitch um, and and we can see how that um, how that would perform. The issue with flat panels is um, is 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 pulling its dirt it, it, its leaves landing on it. It's the panels getting dirty. When when the panels are at pitch, water can uh, yeah. wash, wash off any excess stuff. It, it, my concern would be that they would become inefficient through being dirty. Right. No, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, does anyone else? Have... Yes. Can you ask, Chris? Hi. Hello. Can I? Well, Guy's got his hand up. I see. <laughs> Sue, uh, Sue, you were first, Chris. So, yeah. Shall I, shall I speak? Yeah. We, we've got a partially flat roof, but with a low pitch around three sides in a sort of C shape. So we could fit, you know, north, 
you know, south, east and west panels, but it's a relatively low pitch. So, so is your standard size one times 1.8 meters? Do you have other sizes? Can they be installed horizontally as well as vertically? Um, we, the one benefit is uh, you, you get up to the roof through the house. So we wouldn't need much scaffolding perhaps. Whether that reduces the price, don't know. And finally, on the battery, what sort of size of battery we're we talking about, and typically where do you install it? Okay. Um, yes, panel. The, all the panels are a pretty standard size. That they're different manufacturers. They they, they vary by millimeters, not um, not much else. So they're they're, they're pretty standard size. Um, but they can be installed in portrait as well as um, as well as landscape. Um, installing on three sides in a lot of ways is, is, is the ideal solution. You capture sun in the morning, sun during the middle of the day and, and, and sun in the evening. Uh, it, it requires a bit of um, a bit more a bit more of a complicated inverter arrangement. But we, we, I've got I've got one locally to me actually um, we've done in the last couple of years really, really good system. Um, so yes, that, that can all be done. Uh, scaffolding uh, comes at a cost. And it's inbuilt in, in the figures that are in our list uh, at, a, at a preset rate. So if scaffolding is not required, then that, that rate comes off the, 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 the listed cost. So yes, there is a reduction through not doing scaffolding, but I do need to make sure everyone's safe during the installation process. Um, I think that covered off horizontal. Back, battery size and location. Back, battery size, so physical size. Um, the 8.2 kilowatt hour battery is is a whopper. It, it it's a real beast. It's it's about 90 kilograms. Um, if you picture um, you, you know, like you, 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 your fridge freezer, one of the elements that say so say the bottom part, the freezer the freezer compartment bit, it's about it's about that big, um, and it's just heavy. Um, I've we, we we've I've had to stop installing them in people's lofts because it's just not safe to lift them up. Um, if, if inverters have to go in a loft space, we have to put in uh, the smaller battery, which is the 5.2 kilowatt hour. That's, we can lift that up safely. That's about uh, 65 kilos. Um, often if, if, in, if batteries have to go in a loft um, we, and, and people want more storage than five kilowatts, we, we put multiples of the five kilowatts up. Um, we, we try to, get, if at all possible, we'll put batteries in a garage. Uh, it's the best, off, often the best place. You don't have to lift it too far. It's got a good airflow around it. It's nice and cool. Uh, but they can, they, they can even be installed outside. Uh, you, you can put it on the outside and you can put a nice cover around it. Out there, you can put the inverter as well as the battery. But the 8.2 8 is, is quite big. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, don't know. <laughs> I, I did have my hand up, so I might as well start yeah, speaking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Guy, um, we're at the moment on dual tariff, so we've got some night storage heaters. What are the ways around that? Because I think you mentioned that you couldn't have, well, our supplier won't put a smart meter in for dual tariff, so. Um. Yeah, that's pretty tough. Um, I mean, the good, good thing about having smart uh, having storage heaters is your is is this decarbonized, isn't it? So we haven't got a dirty old gas and oil. That doesn't doesn't help you with your running costs. Um, it, it is possible to have um, uh, batteries that that are wired into the into the off peak side of the circuits. I should just interject. This is only in one room in the house. So the rest of the house is on gas central heating. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess a good off-peak tariff um, would, would would be the solution to cover to cover the running of that heater. Um, what, what what other appliances do you run off your off-peak? Is it just that's all, that's all really? That's it. Yeah. Yeah, and and do you pay a premium to have the off-peak? No. No. Um, I think the, the real option is though really that because you're probably going to have an excess of energy during the day, you can probably just run electric heaters up there, yeah. rather than using night storage heaters. You, you could literally do that. You could you, you could um, 
disconnect your your heaters from 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 that circuit and, and yeah. you say run them from the main circuit, but via a battery or otherwise stored energy from solar. Um, but I, I think I think potentially I need to perhaps talk talk privately to understand that a bit better. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can actually see hands over here on this list. If anyone has a, uh, um, David. We, we've got a site which I think is possibly marginal. Uh, we're, we've got a south facing roof, but we're on a north facing fairly steep slope with fairly tall trees on both sides of us. And in the winter months in, in December, the sun only comes up above the, the crest of the hill um, behind us to the south for about a couple of hours. So is that a situation where solar would still be uh, beneficial? Or is it a case of somebody actually having to visit the site and have a look? Yeah, we need to have a look. Um, if you're if you're look if you're thinking about it now, it's worth kind of keeping an eye on it. So on a nice day, actually go and have a look. Maybe maybe take a couple of pictures of of the roof at various times of the day. So maybe ten o'clock, twelve o'clock, and four o'clock, just to see where the shade is. Um, my my design software. There is a there is a button we click to which takes into account the the geography the topology of the land. So if you are on a steep hill, it, it it will bring that shade factor in. What it won't do is um, apply shade from sh from trees. So right. so a combination of, of of you just just having a look over the next month or two, uh, and and also a, a good site visit. I wouldn't rule out solar because you've got your heavily shaded in 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 this November to January. Um, those months will will probably those three months probably contribute less than ten percent of your annual generation from your solar panels. Right. Basically, they're, they're going to be rubbish then anyway on everyone's on everyone's system. So I wouldn't rule it out just because they're rubbish in, in December. Uh, if the rest of the if now for example you to go out tomorrow. Um, or even in the next couple of months, just just monitor that shade. I wouldn't rule it out just because it's bad in December. Okay, but it will, it will come out of the site survey and and the design process. Thank you. Um, um, but there is a virtual hand raising process on the side of this Zoom thing. If anyone has any more questions, Rupert. Yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, you mentioned the um, your sort of preferred choice of battery. Um, who else would you consider to be a contender and, and what were the factors which resulted in you settling on Give as your preferred supplier? Yeah, um, it's a good question. So we, it was a, it was a, it was a, a good five, six months ago now. I asked, um, so Lewis, some of you, if we do some work, we we'll, might get to know Lewis. He's, um, he's our tech, tech guru. He's, I would put him against anyone in the country for knowledge in, in all the things that we do. Um, I asked him to do a study with the batteries. We, we were already installing Give Energy batteries and we felt that they were very, very good, but I needed, to, I wanted to know if there's anything else out there we were missing. Um, and he had a look. Um, all, all the technical things like round trip efficiency, overall efficiency, depth of discharge of the battery, rate of charge and discharge. It, it, it was amongst you know the, the higher end of, of, of them and they were pretty standard but what's really important for us one is technical support if it goes wrong who do we call are we on the phone to someone from another country or, or are we on the phone to someone local and we um, and the give energy have really good tech support we know the guys individually in their office i think they're in cambridge uh we, we, lewis and, and the team here know those guys if anything goes wrong, there's no quibble. They send engineers out and they change the product. It happens sometimes. Things, you know, things don't turn up working properly. Um, the commissioning process for us is important because we want to we want to install these things efficiently. Um, their batteries are commissioned on the day that we that we go out. So we're going to go out to Mrs. Smith's house. We, we let them know that morning we're, we're we're commissioning that system, and it's done for us when we get there. All the background information is done for us. So commissioning is good. The best thing is their monitoring platform. It's fantastic. You, on their monitoring platform, you can track your uh, your generation, 
your usage of what you generate, what you store, what you export, and what you buy in. And that, that information can be, and people do this, sent to places like Octopus Energy and, and actually be used to control your energy bill. They can, they can decide when to take it and when to, when to charge your battery. Um, so, so it links directly with these time of use tariffs. Other batteries do that too. Um, I did look at Tesla. I couldn't get hold of Tesla. That was my first clue that I couldn't, that I didn't want to work with Tesla. I couldn't speak to them. Um, we, we, we applied to be an installer of theirs and we, we didn't hear anything for months. And they just told me that that was the problem that we were going to have. Um, it's like working with Apple. Um, so we ruled out Tesla and people want, if people come to us asking for a Tesla power wall, we, we, we wish them luck and, and they, they have someone else. Um, there are other products um, and we're always looking, I'm, I'm looking now at um, a, a graphene technology company called Econic. Um, and we're working with them at the moment. And that, that may be something we'll look at in the future, but right now it's still give energy is the best battery that we can put our hands on in, in, in our humble opinion. Thanks. Rupert, I, can I ask if there's another battery you, you, had, you had in mind? Well, I was, yeah, I wondered whether you were familiar with PowerVault. Yeah, I know Power, so I've been, so I've been to PowerVault in London. Um, I, I've, I, I've been on a training course with PowerVault, it's, it's, it's a few years ago now. Um, you don't rate them. <laughs> well, they weren't, they weren't quite ready. Um, they weren't quite ready and their products was physically massive. And their, their main technical guy, their main technical team didn't seem to be able to answer some, some of our more basic questions. Um, I know they've lost some of their team as well. I've been speaking to some members of their team who've moved on to other jobs. Um, they, they never quite felt ready. And I, don't, I don't think they offer anything more than give energy. And I, and I believe they're a bit more expensive. Yeah, thanks. You don't work for PowerVault, do you? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Ozzy's got a question. You need to unmute, Ozzy? No. I'll try to unmute him. Hang on. Uh, it may be that Ian can do it. I can't. I can ask him to unmute. I can't unmute. There you go. Three. Yeah. Right. Um, oh, here we go. Now I'm in trouble. Right. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, it's really good. And thank you to the people of. Um, Whitcomb and Go Green Whitcomb for organizing it. Um, some people found that they put in a, an email to be connected to the program, but didn't get an email back and have not been admitted. Can you explain why this happened? Because and how they could catch up with the information that you have been sharing. Um, so some of these emails, invites, end up in the spam folder. Um, but we are recording this session. So I, I have a recording on my, on my computer after this session. So this can be sent to everybody who has who have missed the presentation. And how would that be arranged? Um, well, the recording will be available here. So if anyone emails us or calls us, we can make sure that it gets sent. It won't get sent from Zoom, but it will get sent from one of our computers. So it's less likely to get caught up, in, caught up in a spam folder. Okay. What is the minimum area on a roof for an economic installation? Um, it's about 10 square meters. Right. And what the sort of is that a very flexible thing, or panels only come in one size? No, it's, it's, it's not. It's pretty inflexible. The, the panels really do come in a in a, in a pretty a pretty standard size, and, that, and that's about one point eight meters by one meter. One point eight times one. Yeah, right. it, it can vary by by centimeters, but not 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 hugely. 
Yes. Uh, does that mean there are a variety of um, of panels? Yeah. Yeah. There, there's there's um, many manufacturers, many models, but the stamp, but the physical size tends to be about the same. So who does the choosing of the panels? Because otherwise, that sounds like more research. Yeah, that, 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 I, I do the, the choosing of the panels. My process for choosing the, the solar panels is quite easy. Um, all panels we would install are from a tier one manufacturer. What that means, uh, when, when these solar farms are built, when the pension funds put money into building solar farms and, and the, the, the banks are involved, uh, they have to use a tier one panel. I'm not entirely sure what that means. I know that they, they check, the company's checked for bankability. I know they've checked for their R&D. I know they checked for their human rights and their manufacturing processes. And, and, and those tier one panels are at the top of the, are the best panels. And tier one is allocated, uh, that accreditation is, is um, given by whom? I believe, and again, I'm... Uh, on the Bloomberg list of tier one panels. So all the all the banks, will, will, there is a list, you can Google the list, of tier one manufacturers. So, right. so, so stage one for me, it has to be tier one. If it's good enough, if it's at top end of the, the panel spectrum for these, these companies to invest in it, then it's good enough. And then how long is the life of the installation? Well, just, 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 just finally, um, then my process is, is um, for the selection of panels, is, is it tier one? Is it a reliable supply? And then it comes down to what is the cheapest and what's available. That's my process. At the moment, I've got a really reliable supply of a, of a, of a particular tier one panel, which is the 360 watt black monocrystalline panel. Um, the life of the panel, the, the warranty for this particular panel, and, and it's pretty standard, is that in 20 year, uh, 25 years time, the panel will be operating at at least 84% of its day one rated output. Right. So it's pretty good. The, the, the panels really do last well. The, the panels are not the problem. I've done this for, goodness, 13 years. And I've not had to change a panel because it's not performing. I've changed panels before because they're damaged. But I've not had to change a panel because it's just not working. And so if I'm understanding you, you have a... Um, electricity collecting panels which then go into a processor a DCAC uh, which then goes into your house and use and then some of it could be stored in a battery is that correct precisely that yeah right and batteries you've given us prices on but you said they're not safe in the loft often. So where is, if a loft floor is strong enough as a floor for um, habitable use, is that strong enough or is that not strong enough? And if where if not there, where's the best place? Yeah, the the, the loft issue, uh, the loft safety issue isn't a, isn't a case of the weight bearing ability of the loft. It, it's it's the weight of the battery for people to lift the battery in it. And then to handle the battery once it's in the loft, um, uh, nine, 95 kilos is just too heavy. Um, we, we install, we try to install as many batteries as possible in garages. They can go outside. They can go outside and be, and you can put a little cover, a little roof over the battery. Right. And therefore, what sort of size? are they what sort of dimensions um, oh my goodness I, I, I will <laughs> one second Probably. steve can you tell everyone a joke when i uh, when i do this <laughs> um, I'm, I'm actually just going to put the data sheet for the battery I've got a feeling in my head it's like a small fridge. It is, yeah. It, um, right. Okay. Uh, so 620 mil high, 480 millimeters wide, so half a meter wide, 
and a depth of 220 millimeters. Okay, lots more questions, but there's lots more people too. Ozzy, if you have a list of questions, uh, just pop them on an email um, to info at idea, and I'll, I'll I, I, between myself and the team, we'll, we'll get back to those tomorrow. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Ian, I, can, can, I, can I ask a, a supplementary? Yeah. What's a typical panel weight? Thinking about thinking of additional weight on roofs. Yeah. Um, 18 kilograms. Thank you. My question is quite simple. What is the lifespan of the battery? Yeah, good question. Um, warranty is 10 years. Um, yeah, 10, 10 years. Like, I can't comment. We, we haven't... It's a relatively new technology. Um, we haven't been installing batteries for anything like 10 years, so I can't say hand on heart. They last 10 years. Um, and the likelihood is you would need to replace them at that point. I, I don't think that at the 10 year, because the batteries will just degrade in their performance. Yeah. Um, it's not to say that at the 10 year point, they're going to just stop working. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's at what stage is the performance of them? So their capacity will just slowly reduce of what they can store, presumably. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, if they last, we have had to change batteries, I've, I've said that, but that's because they haven't come pro pro properly ready. We had no problem getting replacement batteries, only a, only a couple. Um, but once they're done and they're working, they tend to they tend to last nicely. And if any work needs to be done on them, it tends to be a hard um, a firmware upgrade rather, rather than something physical in the battery. Um, I've, um, I think we've run out of questions. Unless Steve, Dead on eight o'clock. <laughs> Can I just ask a quick question? Please do. Yeah. Um, so it's really interesting. I I actually work at the councils, and I'm just in listening mode. But um, I'm quite curious to know. I'm sorry if you've already mentioned this, but what's your sort? What's how long does it take? How long does the process take? Um, so if once when you've got people signed up, are they will you know? Not long. Um, to be honest, this six installation thing, we, I use I use as a gauge for myself. Um, once I've once we've created a, a solar streets project on my system here, that, that that's it. If if three or four people sign uh, on, then we will install those three or four for that rate. It's it's a it's a, it's a calculated risk that I'll take. Um, so it's, so it's not a case of if the first person has a survey done and wants to go ahead that we're going to wait until six are ready. All, all I'll do is wait. If there's three to do, we'll, we'll program that work in for a couple of days and we'll do it. Um, so there's no, it's not, it's not a months, it's not a months long process where you sign up, you have a survey done, then you wait for six, seven, eight, nine, ten people to sign up. Uh, we'll we'll arrange that installation for as for as soon as practically possible. Um, so it could it could be as, as short as so sometimes people sign up, and and it happens within days because we're already in in, in the area doing some work, oh right? Projects. Other times it can take five six weeks. It's just the way. It's just the way that the customers sign up for the projects. If, it, if it's suitable, we do ask people to be flexible, but we don't ask them to wait too long. Great, thank you. Um, right, Steve. I ask you... one more question. Yeah. Um, about the location. This is being promoted in in Woodcombe in Bath. Um, as one of the six, would you go out? Um, five miles south of Bath um, to a very good site up there in Tunley? Or would that have to be viewed completely separately? Well, let's have a chat about that tomorrow, Ozzy, can we? Okay. All right, so I, so I understand fully where that is, that's all. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Colin, you got one? Yeah, just briefly. Um, 
Deborah and I think someone else was asking about flat roof installations. Um, we have a flat roof installation, and if anyone would like to, I mean, just, it, these are quite, they tend to be a bit unique, I think, flat roof installations. If anyone would like to have a look at, at ours and see how we set them up or how they were set up by the company who put them in, um, they'd be very welcome. Uh, any more questions? Tim? Well, I haven't got a question, but just to say um, thank you to Steve and thank you to Ian, because you've been really clear and straight with your answers. And I thought that was brilliant. And just by the way, I've got a 1930s semi-D with three bedrooms and a monthly um, bill to bulb it came down from 90 and I'm now paying 56 pounds a month. So a really good savings to be had from my point of view. Okay, I thought I'd mention that. <laughs> Sorry to jump in, but there might be more questions, but I thought I'd mention that. Thank you. Yeah, we're always pretty straight straight with the, with the prices. You get lots of salespeople that just won't tell you the price of anything. I don't see the point in that. You've got to be told the price at some point anyway. Um, and the prices, are they're there, they don't change. Um, so yeah, it's no point. Is there, are they point beat on the bush, I don't think. No, that was, that was excellent. It was a lot to take in, but uh, I think it was very, very worthwhile. So I really appreciate it, Ian. Thank, thank you very much. Really good. I've, I've got to go, but thank you. Really interesting. Thank you. So basically, if, if, if you know anyone interested, just email uh, idea or uh, or um, info at idea. Info oh, at idea. Yeah. Is that dot com? Yeah. Dot co uk. Dot co uk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, thanks everyone for uh, listening to me ramble on. And thanks, Steve, for asking me to come on. No, it's really good. Thank you. There's Thank you both, Steve and Ian. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I'll be in touch, Ian. I'll be in touch later. Thank you, Steve. See you then. Next few days. Thanks, everyone. Take care.